Happy New Year and welcome to our Hordes Dairymen monthly webinar series. My name is Abby Bauer and I'm an editor for Hordes Dairymen magazine. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is titled The Dairy Price Outlook for 2022, a spotlight on supply, demand, and inflation. Our presenter is Mark Stevenson, the Director of Dairy Policy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As we begin this new year, the dairy industry is filled with both optimism and uncertainty. Dr. Stevenson will lead us through some of the factors that will influence dairy prices in 2022 and share his predictions for the year ahead. This January kicks off our 12th year of our monthly webinar series, and we are thankful for our many dedicated listeners who have tuned in to our programs over that time period. I'm also thankful for my teammates, Michaela King and our, our digital marketing manager and Patty Hurchin, our online media manager, who work on the production and promotion side of our monthly programs. If you're listening to the presentation live, you have access to a PDF of the slides that can be printed. Go down to the handout section in the control panel and you can click on that link and print out those notes that you can use for future reference. Also, if you have any questions that arise during the presentation that you would like to ask Dr. Stevenson, please type those into the questions section of the GoToWebinar um, control panel, and we will answer those following the presentation. Now, it is my honor to introduce to you today's speaker. Mark Stevenson is the Director of Policy and Dairy Policy Analysis at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In this position, Dr. Stevenson conducts and coordinates research and outreach activities related to the dairy industry. He is involved in applied research in the areas of milk assembly costs, processing costs, new processing technology, farm costs, and price risk management. He's also active in the sector level performance, including dairy policy, spatial milk pricing, international trade, and milk price forecasting. Mark also has a second title as the director of Wisconsin Center for Dairy Profitability. In this capacity, he works with faculty and staff to coordinate a, a multidisciplinary approach to farm level problem solving and planning. A native of Michigan, Dr. Stevenson received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Michigan State University, and then later a master's and PhD at Cornell, where he worked prior to coming to Wisconsin. So um, it's a cold day here in Wisconsin, hovering right around zero degrees, but we are glad to have you here, Dr. Stevenson. And I'd like to thank you for joining us. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts on milk prices and what the dairy industry is going to do in 2022. Well, thanks, Abby. And uh, <clears throat> it's cold outside, but it's warm here in the office. So I'm happy to be in. And I uh, welcome everybody from uh, uh, coast to coast, and it's good morning or good afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are. But I did want to talk today about <clears throat> dairy price outlook for 2022. Um, unusual year, and we've boy, we've had uh, a whole string of unusual years, but uh, there are some things that are queued up that I think help us think a little bit about what we can anticipate in the way of uh, milk prices over the year ahead. Um, I'm going to kill my webcam and uh, we'll move on here. Here are the factors that I think are going to be affecting or impacting milk prices. I'll talk more about each of these in more detail. It's domestic demand. Where are we consuming dairy products, in home versus out of home? We certainly saw that that made a difference back in 2020 when uh, all of a sudden we weren't eating in restaurants. So we'll talk a little bit about that and, and what we're eating. We'll look at the domestic milk supply. Boy, that has been a yo-yo for us. We had too much milk when we were safer at home back in March of 2020. And, and then because of farm family food boxes, not enough milk. And then we built up a lot. And, and then more recently, we've been uh, slowing milk production down quite, enough, quite a bit. And perhaps we don't have enough milk at this point in time. And I think that that's what some of these bigger milk prices are trying to tell us. The market wants more milk. Um, we've had strong export demand activity on virtually all of our dairy products. The export competition um, has been mild. Uh, you, European Union New Zealand are producing less milk. Uh, we've had some friction though in the export. 
markets, port congestion and strength of the dollar. We'll talk about all those things. And then finally, I want to have a little bit of a discussion about inflation and what I think that that is and or may be doing in the year ahead. Um, our domestic demand has been good. Uh, if we take a look at the per capita consumption, that's what this chart is showing you of all dairy products, um, the milk equivalent consumption, you can see that even last year in 2020, we were up yet again, not by a great deal, but you know it's continuing the upward climb and upward trend. We in fact had, I think, 644 pounds of milk per capita equivalent in all the dairy products that we eat now or drink. Um, there is a difference, of course, as to what it is that we've been consuming. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll take a look at that. This is showing you the categories of products, some big categories at least, that have been increasing over a longer period of time. Um, showing on the bottom, um, the uh, uh, American cheese category, that's been uh, a slow uh, increase in consumption of American cheese over time. One of the biggest categories has been in other cheeses. That includes, of course, the Italian varieties like mozzarella, but it does include other products as well that have been real growth category for the dairy industry. It's a tremendous increase. Um, we have gone from uh, back in 1975 about 14 pounds of um, cheese consumption per person. Uh, up to about 38 pounds of cheese consumption per person. That, um, in terms of the amount of milk that we are dedicating to uh, the cheese category, has been a real bright star for the dairy industry over a long period of time. So, well done cheese. But last year, uh, both American and other cheese kind of took a breather. Um, it didn't decline, but um, because we weren't having a lot of um, restaurant consumption or out-of-home eating uh, during 2020, the per capita consumption of cheese didn't grow either. <clears throat> it was fairly flat. So cheese took a breather last year. Other product categories, though, like yogurt, actually took a bit of an increase. Uh, that has been a growth category, but um, has been slowing down over the last decade or so. Uh, but last year was a growth category. And butter, more recently, has been a growth category and certainly was last year as well. So all these products have done really very well for us. We have been basically eating our dairy products as opposed to drinking them. And you can see that in our next slide. Um, fluid milk sales did have a little bit of a flourish. You can see over there on the right-hand side during 2020 that there was an uptick. Again, this happened when we were safer at home. Uh, we did stay there. And as we stayed at home, went out to the grocery store, we tended to buy that extra gallon of milk and we consumed it. Um, even uh, products that are related to fluid milk consumption like, uh, um, like our cold cereal categories had a bit of an increase in 2020. Unfortunately, as we got back out of the home more and out to restaurant sales, uh, fluid milk sales have continued on their decline path, but they did have a bit of a flourish in 2020. Um, so again, uh, this is very consistent with eating our dairy products as opposed to drinking them. There, now I've got control, thank you. Um, dairy cow numbers uh, are, had retreated last year. And let's just take a couple of slides to take a look at what's been happening to the milk supply. If you look at the purple line, this was 2020. And you will note that uh, in 2019, we had some fairly optimistic forecasts for milk prices at the end of 2019. And we saw people beginning to hang on to cows and cow numbers increasing January, February, and March <clears throat> from er year earlier levels. But in March, we had too much milk. We had plants that weren't able to sell product, finished product to restaurant chains. And we, in fact, had a lot of supply management imposed on, from our cooperatives or even the plants that we direct ship to, which simply said, we can't take all the milk. Please do something. And so farms uh, called dairy cows. You can see that in the purple line here. 
again, uh, we had national response from programs like Farm to Family Food Box that said, no, no, we actually are going to be moving some of these dairy products um, through giveaway of food. And that caused us to have uh, increased demand, prices uh, buoyed considerably. And you'll see our cow number started to move back up in that purple line toward the end of the uh, year. Now, the red line is showing you 2021. Our numbers, cow numbers peaked back here in May um, of 2021, uh, above nine and a half million dairy cows. We hadn't seen that many dairy cows in the U.S. herd for a quarter of a century. So this was a big number of dairy cows. It's a lot of capacity and represents a lot of opportunity for us to produce milk. But as the year went along, we started to uh, have problems, I guess, uh, keeping that many dairy cows in the national herd because our margins were actually pretty thin. Although milk prices were good, uh, feed costs were high, and we saw exits of herds, even large dairy herds, out of the west and southwest in a way that we haven't seen in quite a long time. That pulled back the dairy cow numbers uh, to the levels where they're below year earlier now um, with the last report we had for November. So dairy cow numbers retreated, and it was one of the ways in which dairy farmers chose to reduce milk production uh, when we had supply controls being implemented. Another way that um, we saw farmers uh, responding to those supply controls was with milk per cow. Here again, look at the purple line. This was a very normal increase, seasonal increase in milk per cow, but we didn't peak in April uh, as is typical, April or May, um, typical of our seasonal patterns. We peaked back in March because that was when those impositions of um, less milk being shipped to plants were, were put in place. And we simply took our foot off the gas and dairy cows began to produce less milk per cow until we had this need and price signal for stronger milk supplies. And this is a surprising thing to me that farms actually were able to respond with milk per cow in a short term basis. Normally in the past, we would have thought about if you're doing something that is taking the top off a lactation curve, you can't get that back until the next lactation. But we see that now better feeding and farm management um, has allowed farms to be able to pivot much more quickly than we did before. And in June, we had an increase in milk per cow. That's been persistent until most recently. Um, in the red line here, <clears throat> you'll notice that our milk per cow is no higher now since August than it was the year ago. And that's largely, I think, due to the high feed costs. So we're simply choosing not to push cows quite as hard for milk production or milk yields. You put those two things together, cow numbers and uh, milk per cow, and you can see that we've had a change in milk production from year earlier levels. Uh, it's normal for us to have an increase of one to 2%. That's normally about what we need just to take care of our increased demand for milk uh, domestically uh, with perhaps a little bit more to export. Um, we had big numbers showing up in May of this past year of 2021, but that's in part because if you look at May of 2020, we had a sharp reduction in milk supplies uh, as we uh, were doing that safer at home and milk supply controls put into place. However, uh, we did have strong milk production increases. More recently, uh, without having production controls in place in, in that I know of, at least in parts of the country, uh, we have seen uh, flat to negative uh, milk production. November's milk production was below year earlier levels, and that's not something we see very often at all. So milk supplies domestically are generally fairly tight right now, and that's giving rise to some optimistic prices on dairy products that we'll talk about a little later. When we take a look at where has milk production declined, you can see that the upper Midwest um, especially a state like South Dakota, has still had some increases in milk production. 
Um, South Dakota has had big increases in milk production as we're still filling plants along that I-29 corridor. Um, but in other areas of the country, especially in the West and Southwest, we've had declines in milk production. Um, that's not normal for us to see those. Uh, declines in the West where we're producing product that is exported quite a bit, uh, milk powders, for example, uh, it means that we're drawing down on stocks of dairy products for those exports that are going out while we've been still increasing milk production a little bit and cheese primarily in the upper Midwest. Um, the Northeast and other regions of the country have also been relatively tight with milk production. Export demand has been larger than ever. Um, this chart is showing you both exports in blue and imports of dairy products in red on a pounds of solids or percent of solids uh, relative to percent of solids produced in milk production. And you'll see that there's been <clears throat> some ups and downs, but in general, since 2004 or five, that trend for exports has been increasing and we've had larger exports than ever before. This particular chart is showing you a rolling 12 month average just to take some of the month to month variation out of there. And in general, we've been up something like exporting 17 and a half percent of our uh, milk solids at this point in time and imports of dairy products are actually down. Uh, a little bit. So export demand has been strong. <clears throat> and in fact, export demand has been strong on really all of our dairy products that we export in several categories. Next slide, please. This chart is showing you <clears throat> a number of the dairy products, including butter fat, just as a category, which includes butter oils and butter. Uh, you'll notice that <clears throat> although it's relatively small in volume, um, there was a pretty big uptick in 2021 of the butterfat category. Same thing is true for cheese. Not a big category for us typically, but it was an increase the last couple of years. Lactose, mild increase, but uh, for uh, skim and nonfat milk powders, we had a pretty big increase in exports as well as whey products. So all of these products are just showing you that across the board, we've had an increase in dairy products. Uh, exported. We've had increases to several of our customers as well. If we look at um, this chart, it's showing you not the product, but the total volume of exports. And one of the notable countries has been China. Pretty big increase in uh, 2020, but also 2021 uh, to that country. If you look at some other countries, uh, the Middle East, North Africa has shown steady increases over the last two years. Mexico, our historically largest customer for exports, um, was a little bit out of the party last year in 2020, but has rejoined again this year. The exports have been brisk to Mexico. Uh, South America increasing in general, same for Korea, and Southeast Asia has been strong the last couple of years. So we're increasing export customers across the board. When we look at the competition for exports, um, we have major players that include New Zealand and the European Union. Those two are generally larger exporters than the U.S., and uh, we come in third place right now. Australia uh, is another major exporter, but we're larger uh, than they are in terms of exports, and Argentina. There are certainly other countries that are net exporters of dairy products, but those uh, five uh, countries or groups of countries uh, represent you know, the larger ex major competition for exports. The dashed line here in black is showing you the percent change in milk production from those exporting countries except for the U.S. The red line is showing you U.S. exports. Now you'll notice that the black line has been showing flat to negative exports over the last few months. And um, the red line is showing you U.S. Um, milk production change. And that is not quite showing you the November numbers where we have negative milk production for the U.S. So really all of the major exporters are tight on milk supply. The world 
has been demanding dairy products, um, but most of the major milk producing countries that export dairy products are not able to keep pace with that. We're drawing on our stocks and we're signaling that with higher prices in world markets uh, for dairy products. We've had some friction in exports though. Certainly port congestion has been a major point of uh, discussion. Um, most of our dairy products are shipped in these shipping containers and the shipping container cost to move a container from Los Angeles, the port of Los Angeles to say Shanghai um, had been about $3,000 per container. So on a per pound basis of what's shipped, it's relatively small. But that increased to as much as $20,000 when we had strong port congestion and demand for empty containers in Asia as they were frantically trying to get products from Asia here. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we get our iPhones and TVs and uh, computer chips and things. So there were a lot of these shipping containers that were going back empty because we simply couldn't take the time to fill those with products like dairy that wanted to go the other direction. It's somewhat better now. Um, the shipping costs are about $12,000 per container um, and we are getting product out. We've managed to do that over the time period, um, but port congestion has been a friction in the export category, but um, it's getting a, a little bit better. I think that actually we're gonna see some port congestion for maybe as much as the next two or three years um, it's not going to go back to the relatively frictionless export that we had um, and port congestion is just going to be a problem for a period of time it takes time to work all of these frictions out of the supply chains it's not just a dairy supply chain problem it is uh, just uh, the uh, uh, shipping of, of all products that are moving from country to country if we take a look at another friction, uh, it's actually the value of the dollar. This chart is showing you the value of the US dollar against um, many of the foreign currencies that we compete with. Now, it sounds like a strong dollar should be a good thing, uh, and it is if you're buying products from other countries. That way, uh, our dollars buy more products from other countries. But if we're trying to export, products like dairy products from the United States, a strong dollar means that it takes more currencies uh, or more uh, uh, value in other currencies to buy that US product. So if you take a look back to that gray vertical bar in here back in early 2020, this is a, a gray bar that denotes months when we were technically uh, in a recession. And during that time period, oddly enough, the US dollar is strong. That's because a lot of other countries were also in recession during that early COVID time period. And during a time period of economic turmoil across the globe, uh, currencies tend to fly toward the US dollar. In other words, US dollars are purchased uh, because it's considered to be a relatively safe harbor compared to almost any other country. That gave strength to the US dollar, not a good thing for dairy exports. But the value of the dollar retreated um, all the way through early part of 2021. But since about mid 2021, you'll notice here <clears throat> in the right hand uh, portion of this graph that the dollar has been strengthening. Again, that's a little bit of friction. It's hardly uh, a problem that we can't overcome, but it does mean that our value of products have to be competitive enough to be able to export against a strong dollar. When we take a look at prices of US products, they're competitive. Now this graphic is showing you skim milk powder prices. And the red line is showing you the US non-fat or skim milk powder price. And the blue line is showing you the European Union, major exporter of milk powders. Um, Oceania is shown in green. The US is always competitive with milk powder prices. And the reason that we're always competitive is that we're exporting about half of that product that's made here in the US. That's a lot of dairy product. 
And you know, you you can't export half of your product unless it's always price competitive, and we are. So we are price competitive for uh, skim milk powder at this point in time. When you take a look at other products, though, like cheese, we're occasionally competitive. There are time periods when we're very competitive. Notice that sharp dip in there just prior to 2020. We had a period of time when cheese, U.S. cheese was very inexpensive, and uh, we did manage to ship a little slug of that over there. But shortly afterward, that was followed by very high cheese prices, not competitive at all, and uh, those cheese exports just stopped. However, uh, you know, since mid-19 or mid-2020 uh, through 2021, we've had very competitive cheese prices and we have been selling more cheese overseas. I also think that partly because of the um, capacity that we've put on in the uh, United States here with a few new uh, cheese plants, like the large one in Michigan and some major expansion of other plants, that we are going to be producing enough cheese in this country <clears throat> that we're simply going to have to be competitive with cheese. It can't be just a domestic market that carries that product, sometimes with very high cheese prices. So I think that cheese prices are likely to be in a somewhat lower but more stable uh, range and competitive with other products like skim milk and butter prices uh, going forward. So I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Butter prices are also competitive. Again, not always the case, <clears throat> but um, our butter prices have been strong here in the US, but they're even stronger out of places like the European Union and Oceania. This is just an indication that butter fat is tight around the world right now, and we are exporting more butter than we have before. It, this is a product where we have to be sh sure that we're going to export because we need to make an 82% butter fat uh, product, not the 80% we normally do, and it has to be in different package sizes for export. Um, but if we can be assured that our butter prices are going to be competitive on a regular basis, then we can manufacture product for export on a regular basis too. So this I think is a good thing and portends well for US exports of butter. I wanna shift gears now just a little bit and talk about inflation. Inflation is one of those things that uh, we haven't really talked about for a very long time, partly because it has been the target that the Fed has pursued. The, Fed, the Federal Reserve likes to see inflation around 2%. It doesn't wanna see it at zero. If it's zero, that means that <clears throat> there's just not enough economic activity to um, cause enthusiasm you know, in our economy. So they would like to see a small amount of inflation, but if it's too much inflation, then we start to have uh, disruptive things happening. So 2% is what the Fed actually targeted for a long period of time. And they adjusted things like the money supply uh, to try to maintain that rate of inflation. More recently, <clears throat> since we've had great recession um, in 08 and uh, 09, uh, and we've had high levels of unemployment periodically, including through this time period with COVID, um, the Fed has started to look less at inflation and more at employment levels to worry about whether or not they should try to tighten the money supply in an effort uh, to uh, rein things in a little bit, or if they should keep it very loose. We've had an incredibly loose money supply and tried to keep money uh, readily available to folks and a low interest rate as a result of that. But if you look back in, uh, no, uh, if we go back to that chart, thank you. Um, September, the last month, or November, I mean, the last month that we had data for, we had 6.8% inflation rate. We have to go all the way back four decades to find when we had an inflation rate that large. Now, back in the 1980s, you can see here that we had double digit inflation rates uh, for a period of time that was very disruptive to an economy. So the Fed has, has said and felt pretty strongly that this is a temporary blip. 
that this is not persistent inflation. And yet now we see inflation continuing to climb to levels where they're beginning to doubt whether that's the case. And I doubt it myself. So if we could move to the next slide, um, I'd like to look at this. Fiscal policy is the government spending money. It's not the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve deals with monetary policy. And fiscal policy has historically been one of the places where we can have a cause of persistent inflation. Just to give you an example, spending on war is often caused inflation because we can spend billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in wartime efforts. And when we do that, um, that kind of spending on the part of the government can cause inflation. We've had big spending on the part of the government because of stimulus money uh, for COVID with job losses out there. And that can be a source of inflation. Just to give you an example, I mean, spending money to counteract uh, job losses from COVID-19 would not necessarily be inflationary on its own because if we have people who've lost their jobs because of COVID and uh, plants shutting down, putting money in their hands is only a, a different source of of income from them, not necessarily more money in the uh, marketplace. However, there are lots of people like myself who received a stimulus check. It was indiscriminate, at least as far as that goes. I, I didn't ever lose a check from uh, the university here, so I received stimulus money when I really felt like I shouldn't have. That can be a source of inflation. We've also passed bills for infrastructure spending. We aren't spending a lot of that money just yet, but boy, by the time we start putting that into roads and bridges and uh, broadband and a variety of other things, that's a large amount of money and it can be um, uh, perhaps large enough to cause some persistent inflation. And we haven't even talked about climate change abatement. If we start to pass some of those things, um, that could be enough more money being pumped into the U.S. economy that, that could be uh, a stimulus toward persistent inflation. But historically, it's not just fiscal policy. There's going to be some kind of structural cause out there. Um, this sort of, did we skip one slide? Not really sure. Um, no. This is the slide, thanks. Uh, monetary policy is not the cause of inflation, but it's always the cure. If the Federal Reserve feels like they need to rein in inflation, they'll have to increase interest rates. They'll have to pull money out of the, the supply of money out and tighten that up a little bit. That does a couple of things. For one thing, it makes borrowing money less appealing because interest rates are higher. And that means that we cut down on spending. We aren't going to borrow money to spend if it's more expensive to borrow it. It also makes saving more attractive. That is, we cut down on spending by doing that as well. So uh, this is the way for us to reduce persistent inflation, but um, we have to be convinced that we actually have persistent inflation in place. We do have some money to spend. <clears throat> this uh, graphic is showing you personal savings rate. So it's typical for us in the U.S. to save somewhere between 6 7% of our income, which is not very large compared to many other countries, but it's been adequate for us to uh, achieve retirement goals. But notice when we get out here to 2020, wow, those peaks went from 6 or 7% up to more than 30%. Well, this is, again, because we were safer at home. All of a sudden, we weren't spending money um, to commute to work. We were staying at home and working. Um, so we didn't spend the money that we normally do on our just day-to-day -day getting to work and back. We weren't taking vacations. So the hospitality sector really suffered. We weren't flying and spending our money on airplanes or hotel rooms. And so we saved it. Uh, we had quite a bit of money there. And actually that caused us to spend money on some other things. We wanted to make our home a little bit nicer. We wanted to buy a treadmill so we could exercise and, and stay there. We wanted to buy a new washing machine or television. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of durable goods have been purchased from those savings that we had. Um, we also had a lot of people who were looking to upgrade their home themselves. So if we're staying at home with our kids, they're driving us crazy. Maybe we want a bigger yard for them to go out and play in. And housing prices have been just through the roof, as have uh, demand for uh, material goods to build houses. Next slide. So we have some structural causes <clears throat> of inflation. 40 years ago, a structural cause of inflation was a cost push that came from energy prices. OPEC was formed during that time period from the oil producing countries to short the world um, the supply of oil and that increased price of oil. Now, when that happened, we had government mandate uh, to partially try to address that problem. Uh, that just said, make cars more efficient, you know, and our cars got 12, 14 miles per gallon back then, and today they get 30 plus miles per gallon. We've achieved a lot of that, and now we're going to electric vehicles. The government also provided incentives back then to insulate our homes, make them more energy efficient. Energy was at the base of everything that we do and everything that we build. Um, all the equipment. So when energy was a higher price, that was a persistent cause of inflation. We don't have that so much, even though energy is a little bit higher today. Today, I think the cost push is really coming from a labor shortage. A lot of this was pandemic inspired. So a lot of folks decided that I'm tired of my job, my old job. Uh, I can get it hired almost anywhere right now. Um, I want to change jobs. So we had that kind of thing happening. We also had a lot of dual income houses that made the calculation that it would be better for them to keep one person at home watching the kids and trying to get them to do their homework. Um, and so there were a number of people that simply dropped out of the labor market because of that. And you've had baby boomers making earlier retirement decisions than they did in the past. I want to just let you know that all of these things would have happened without the pandemic, but they happen sooner and they happen all at the same time. So these demographics, you know, are just causing us labor shortage out here. And, you know, labor wages was a lot like energy. It's at the base of all the things that we build and all the things that we do. So that can be a persistent cause of structural inflation. And I think that that's one of the concerns that the Fed is going to worry about, whether they need to chase, um, you know, in higher interest rates. We need to evaluate our capital investments carefully. I'm old enough to remember what the world was like 40 years ago. And that was kind of when I came into my, um, you know, current positions in agriculture and we began to work. Back then, we had investments that were being made, not so much based on a return on the investment, but we looked at a return on asset values. Why? Because asset values were increasing over that time period as well. So an asset didn't have to pay for itself in terms of the investment, because we could probably count on that tractor increasing in value or the land increasing in value. We found out, of course, um, in the late 80s and early 90s that we couldn't always count on that. And that caused some pretty severe problems in agriculture. So if you're thinking about some extra money that you may have at the end of the year and are, are wanting to invest that in capital goods, do it on the basis of a return on the investment, not on the expected return on asset values. Since labor shortage is real and probably long lasting, I think that one of the things we should be really looking at is considering the investments in labor saving uh, capital investments. Automated milking is, is kind of a no brainer, feed pushing, those sorts of things. Um, those are proven technologies at this point in time and we're looking at more and new ones all the time. John Deere recently announced um, fully automated tractors and that they will <clears throat> be building them in fairly large numbers even this next year. So, you know, there's a big rush to automate all kinds of things to ease the labor shortages that we see. 
uh, in agriculture, that's probably going to be a good investment because it's not just a place to park maybe some extra dollars that you have at the end of the year, but it's also uh, going to save you on costs of uh, production going forward. Next one. So here's my forecast for prices. Sorry, this slide looks a little bit muddy, but if you look out there at the last 25% of that slide on the right-hand side, those are dashed lines. And those are my forecast prices for class three, class four, and all milk prices. Um, I'm really looking at something that would be pretty substantial increase from where we were last year, about a $22 US all milk price on average, and frankly, fairly flat right now. Um, we may have some bumps along the way that cause volatility. I'm expecting that we will. I just don't know what they are. I can't forecast that yet. Um, but if you take a look at last year, we had an average all milk price that was more like $19. So we're looking at something that's going to be um, a good two and a half, two to two and a half dollars above where we were last year. It could be a good milk price as long as your costs of production are not that high. Uh, so if you've got um, adequate feed in the bunk that you have uh, produced and harvested already, it might be a decent year. Next slide, please. So in summary, we've had good domestic demand. There's been some product shifting, but demand has basically been good. Right now, it's a little bit lackluster, but it's not bad. And uh, we've had strong demand even through a bad year. Domestic supply. Things are actually a little bit tight right now, particularly in the West. So if we aren't having excess milk that's making its way to um, butter and powder plants, um, our butter fat supplies are actually a little bit tight. Cheese plants have been sopping up some of the extra milk and there's not a lot of extra cream running around uh, looking for a home for butter. Export demand has been really strong across all product categories. The world is tight on supplies, and I think that uh, there's going to be an opportunity to sell more product out here. Our competition has shown that the EU is down. Uh, Germany, France, um, and Great Britain are all down in milk production. Those are the large milk producing countries in the European Union. New Zealand is also below your earlier levels. There's some friction in exports, but port congestion is getting better and our product prices are competitive. I think that we should pick up market share because of this over this next year. Inflation to me is the big unknown. Keep your eye on investments, um, You know, think about them, consider them fairly carefully. In my opinion, this is a year to be cautious with our investments um, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe think about what kind of investments we really wanna make on the farm. I think it's going to be a good year for milk prices, but continue to look at risk management options. My goodness, the other day we had $22 class three milk, not all milk price, but class three milk. Uh, you know, so tuck a floor under some of those price opportunities when they present themselves. And for sure, always look to control your variable costs of production. That is what I have for you today. So um, I suspect we can maybe consider taking uh, some questions, Abby. Yes, thank you, Dr. Stevenson, for sharing your insight and your predictions for the dairy industry in 2022. There are certainly many moving parts that factor into those forecasts, and I know it's not easy to predict, but we appreciate um, all this information that you shared, and we also are glad to hear that 2022 is looking like a more positive year, year for our industry. Um, if you would like to view this webinar again or any of our previous webinars, we want to let you know that they are all available on our archives, which you can find at our Horde Steeryman website on the webinar tab. And this webinar will be posted later this week, but all of our past webinars from the last 12 years are available online right now. So please check that out if you want to listen to a previous program. And we also hope that you'll make plans to attend our upcoming webinars. Just a reminder that our Horde Steeryman monthly webinars always take place the second Monday of the month at noon central time. Next month in February, we will have a presentation titled What the New NRC Means for Your Herd. And our presenter will be Bill Weiss from The Ohio State University. And that webinar will be sponsored by QLF. 
And then in March, we have a presentation titled, The Details Add Up to High Production. And this will be a special duo of a veterinarian, Dr. Mark Hardesty, and then a dairy farmer from Indiana, Alex Neuenschwander, who will be talking about what they do on their farm to get a high herd average and um, maintain high production on their farm. So please make plans to attend these future webinars if these topics are interesting to you. Now we will go through a few questions that came in prior to the webinar, and then we will answer the questions that have come in during the show. We have a good group here, but if anyone else wants to ask any questions, please type those in to the questions <coughs> section right now. Um, our first question here, Dr. Stevenson, is the spread between class three and class four has caused havoc for federal orders for some time, even before COVID-19 and those government programs that resulted really disrupted the markets. Are there any developments, economic or otherwise, on the horizon that could dampen the spread or reduce the volatility of class three? Well, I think in the uh, near term, um, when we're looking at these price relationships out here now, we are expecting class three and class four prices to be in tighter relationship to each other than we've seen them in years. Um, that's what futures markets are forecasting. Um, and I don't have any basis to, you know, feel strongly that they wouldn't be the case. Uh, we have uh, high butter values, uh, and so butter fat will be relatively high. We have high skim milk price values, so those are going to keep class four prices up. Uh, class three, uh, cheese demand has been strong, and I think that uh, as long as those two stay relatively close to each other, the average of the two is not going to cause any great amount of uh, negative PPDs and deep pooling. So that's, I think, the uh, significant disruptions that this question was talking about. Um, a little bit longer term, we've had a couple of senators, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand from New York and uh, Bernie Sanders from Vermont, who have requested maybe even required is the, the stronger word for it, that we hold a hearing to talk about um, some of these class one issues uh, that they, they call them class one issues. Um, and you know we, we'll certainly look at things that can be done from the standpoint of changing federal orders and the way that they uh, price milk that might cause those negative PPDs to not happen very frequently. Um, so we'll have to see there. But I think that just the marketplace itself has taken care of the problem uh, in the short term. Thank you. And then our next question, federal order butterfat values seem to be better than protein values in the CME market futures markets as of December 2021. Does the weakness in milk production as of late suggest this relationship will persist for 2022? You know, Actually, the protein values are still bigger than the butter fat values are. That's um, over a longer term um, time frame, that's been the norm for us to have higher protein values than butter fat. But we did go through quite a stretch with higher butter fat values uh, as well. That kind of inverted a few months ago, and uh, you know, we're back to stronger protein values now. Um, frankly, I think that we're going to be. Uh, in a range where we see them being closer together as opposed to too far apart. Um, through 12 months, basically, the middle part of 2020 through the middle part of 2021, uh, we had protein prices much higher, you know, as cheese prices were so high, the farm to family food boxes and other things. Uh, much higher than butterfat prices, and that's what really caused a lot of those negative PPDs that we had. It was a very unusual time period. They're coming back closer together, but I think that protein price is likely to still be the leader, uh, partly because of those very strong uh, forecast class four prices out there. Very good. Thank you for answering those questions. And now we'll move on to questions that came in during the presentation. So the first one here is talking about fluid milk consumption and says, how much of the fluid milk decline is the result of plant-based alternatives that are on the market? Yeah, you know, that chart that I had shown halfway through the presentation, 
or maybe it was more toward the early part of the presentation, the decline in, in uh, fluid milk sales. Those are total sales, not just per capita. Um, and, you know, the total sales were relatively flat until about 2010. And that's when we started to see this strong, almost straight line trend downward that we're still apparently on today. I think they're attributable to lots of things, but boy, we've had plant-based milks well before 2010. I think that plant-based milks are, or beverages are um, part of the problem, but I don't think they're the entire problem. We've also just had, you know, just a, a change in personal preferences. And, you know, here I could just say, I don't buy plant-based milks at all, but um, I, it was common for me to wake up in the morning and have a bowl of cold cereal with uh, milk, you know, on that cereal. And I haven't had a box of cereal in my cupboard for quite some time. So I'm not consuming as much beverage milk as I used to either. However, I've got just cartons of yogurt in the refrigerator always, and I have a carton of yogurt every morning. That's category shifting. My tastes and preferences have changed. So, you know, this is, it's it's not a simple thing to simply say plant-based milks are the cause of all of our decline in fluid milk consumption. Um, it, it's more complex than that. Okay. The next question talks about the cow populations. And if we talk about the, the national herd and the change in population over the last couple of years, how does that change compare between the different regions, let's say the west and the southwest versus the midwestern and eastern parts of the country? Well, we've had growth areas, and you may remember, I think uh, Hordes published that quite a few years ago. I did this more granular than just a state um, kind of map that showed hot spots of where are we seeing increases and declines in milk production um, at the county level, basically. And, you know, we what, we, what we've tended to find is that plant capacity and milk production and thus cows tend to be growing together. So when we get a plant, Michigan is a little bit of a different story, you know, and, and it goes against the, uh, uh, this kind of um, story that I'm trying to tell here, but Michigan had growth in milk production pretty much across the major milk producing areas of the western part of the state, the thumb area of Michigan, and even the uh, middle northern part of the state, a lot of milk produced in the state and plant capacity just didn't keep up with it until the point that they had to have a new milk plant or dairy plant in the state. However, most of the time what we're finding is that plants are kind of um, co-joining with dairy production and saying that, look, we need more capacity in a region like the I-29 corridor. It's a great place to produce milk. We've got some land available there. We can do it. Let's add some capacity in that area um, or in Colorado um, or in Oregon or in New Mexico um, or in Northern Texas. So uh, that tends to be the kind of growth patterns that we've seen is where do dairy farmers want to produce milk? Uh, where do they think they can? and where do plants want to build an operation uh, to meet their customers' needs. That tends to be the way that we see milk production growing in spots as opposed to whole big regions. Thank you, Mark. Yes, I do remember that map that we had published. So, um, The next question is somewhat related. What effect does export demand have on production going forward and does that impact Western producers more than it impacts dairy farmers, say, in the Midwest or the East? Well, again, I think that this is a part of our continually changing um, dairy environment here. Um, the West has been strongly surplus in milk production. In fact, they're, you know, uh, more than 30 billion pounds of milk net deficit or net surplus, uh, if you look at a big swath of those Western states. and that milk is going to be made into dairy products and moved somewhere. If you take a look at the whole upper Midwest, we're also a little more than 30 billion pounds of milk surplus on an annual basis. Again, that's gonna be made into product and moved to where the needs actually are. Historically, 
the East Coast and the Southeast in particular have been net deficit and dairy products have tended to move from the surplus areas into those deficit areas. The upper Midwest has made cheese. It's a nutritionally dense product that we can ship long distances at relatively low cost. And we've tended to service those East Coast and Southeastern markets. The West Coast um, is further away from those deficit markets in the East. And so they have tended to look toward the West, i.e. exports to other countries. And um, those have meant, you know, skim milk powder and occasionally butter. So I think going forward, we're likely to see um, milk production and dairy products being a little bit surplus of our domestic needs, even for cheese. I mentioned that additional capacity that we've had. So I expect that we're going to be exporting cheese on a regular basis um, going forward. That can come out of the upper Midwest. That can come out of uh, the West or almost anywhere else. So uh, again, exports, I think, are going to be much more of a just a who's surplus of dairy products and where they're going to go. I think the West will continue to be butter powder heavy, but join in the cheese exports a little bit. Upper Midwest is certainly going to become a more regular exporter of cheese. You touched on this a little bit, but maybe if you have any further comments. So you talked about the milk prices for 2022, but how does the the higher input costs, such as fertilizer, energy, and equipment, you know, what what do you any thoughts on what that is going to do to milk milk prices or maybe dairy profitability in the year ahead? Yeah, I've been trying to noodle this one out. You know, this is where we get down to lots of moving parts. <clears throat> um, in places of the country where we tend to buy more of our feed inputs, even forages, um, I think this is where you're going to find margins being particularly thin and, and more difficult to make the decision to produce more milk. In places where we've got plenty of feed and the quality is relatively good, I think that the uh, purchases of some supplemental protein, maybe a little bit of energy, corn, um, is going to make it attractive to produce milk. So uh, I, I think this is going to be a little bit different this year. We will find some farms that will have pretty good margins as long as they keep all of their other cost input costs relatively low. I, I'm also expecting, and I have to see how this plays out, but you know, how much do we draw on some of the fertility that we may have banked in the soil? Um, this next year. In other words, maybe not uh, put quite as much fertilizer on crops. How much do maybe we start to think about shifting back maybe a little bit more toward alfalfa uh, and a little bit away from corn silage, you know, a more uh, uh, fertilizer intensive crop? Um, I don't know. These are these are questions uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure that I've got all the answers for them. Those are some good points to for everyone to consider. Um, what do you think will have a bigger impact on farms and herds expanding, feed costs or labor shortages? Well, um, I think that feed costs are likely to be a more uh, perennial problem, uh, or they could be. Uh, labor costs are something that we are actually getting to the point where we can do something about it. It does require a big capital investment, I mean, a huge capital investment. Uh, to think about uh, putting in uh, automated milking systems um, in especially larger herds, but it can be done, and we're seeing that done, and this is becoming better and better all the time. Automated feed pushing, um, and actually it's getting surprising how relatively um, much labor we're able to drop out of some of these farms uh, with automation. That is something that's doable. We still have to feed cows. We aren't going to get milk without feeding them. So feed costs are, are the kind of thing that is hard to get around. We can look for alternative sources, but the prices of alternatives tend to follow all each other up and down. You can talk about automation. We did have someone ask how immigrant labor fits into the labor conversation. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Not so much, um, but immigrant labor has become a real problem for us. I mean, it was a real opportunity for the past 20 some years. 
Um, but honestly, as some of the uh, economies of the countries from which the immigrant labor has come has improved, like Mexico, for example, um, we found that much of that labor supply has just dwindled and gone away. Also true that when there's good alternatives to working in agriculture on the farm, uh, maybe even construction or hospitality, if those pick back up, then I think it's, you know, we're, we're all fighting for the same labor source. So um, it's, it's going to be an issue. Um, agriculture is not at the top of the list for being able to claim um, uh, the, the kind of labor that uh, we want to have on our farms. Sure, absolutely. When we look ahead to the summer and feed costs, as you mentioned, do you have any predictions as to what the corn price will do next summer? I mean, I know some of your um, compadres in the department probably follow these pretty these numbers pretty closely, but any comments on corn price in the year ahead? Uh, I don't, you know, I mean, I have to draw lines around something and this is one where I can get out over my ski tips pretty far, pretty fast, you know, with uh, talking about those feed prices. I, I do know that, um, you know, for example, Paul Mitchell here in our department gets enthusiastic as he's talking about corn and soybean uh, prices for the year ahead and the profitability that they expect. And I remind him that in this state, Paul, most of that is feed. It's not, uh, you know, for sale. Um, so, or we're buying it. And, and that doesn't have quite the same connotation as the enthusiasm you have for selling it. So um, they are expecting higher prices, but I, I'm not prepared to comment really on corn soybean prices. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for those thoughts. Um, another question, this came up, they're asking about one of the slides you shared, I believe, but why is there a different fat level for domestic and international butter, 80% for domestic versus 82% for international? Um, thoughts it's, there? It's historic. Um, you know, we, uh, we churned butter at about 80% um, butter fat standard and a little higher water content um, in our butter than uh, we, we see in, in most um, other countries. Most other countries have 82% butter fat. You can rework butter, um, but that's expensive to do. So if you've got a bunch in storage that you made at 80%, you could rework it to an 82% butter, but you know you don't wanna do that. That adds cost that uh, is simply more a means of getting, uh, getting that out of here. 82% um, butter can be very nice, is desirable for some things, but frankly, it doesn't spread on my toast quite as easily in the morning either. So um, I'm still buying domestic butter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is When we look at California specifically and the water availability issues there, do you foresee it to become, that it's becoming unsustainable for California to be a large milk producer considering those constraints? Yeah, you know, it's going to be an interesting thing to me to see, you know, what happens as we get a little bit more towards summertime this year. You may remember back, oof, what was it, 15, 20 years ago when California was again in one of the most significant droughts that they have ever been in. And there were all these prognostications about how it's going to take decades to refill the reservoirs and all of that with water. And then we had this one year with huge mountain snows and big rains and poof, you know the next spring it's all good we're all full again um i think that this year is starting to look a little bit like that we've had tremendous precipitation with some of those offshore storms that are just pumping moisture into the region who knows um long term it's going to be a problem i mean climate change we we can't deny or even you know talk about well maybe or maybe not it it is happening and uh, the fact that the west is drier and the population there is going to get the first dibs on water i think is is a no brainer so it's going to be more difficult in the long run to water almond trees or uh, uh, you know alfalfa for dairy cows but I'll tell you what, I think that if you're wondering what gets the water first, I think it's going to be people, um, then long-term investments like uh, nut trees and, and uh, grapevines, 
than it is alfalfa fields that can be replanted in a year. Mm -hmm. Certainly a different situation out there. I think this is a pretty common question when people talk about growing exports. How vulnerable might we be to world dairy prices in the future as we export more and more of our dairy products? Well, I don't think that vulnerable is the right word. Um, we are competitive now. And these are prices, you know, where I think a lot of dairy producers say, I, I can live at that. Um, our, our real problem, in my opinion, has been that um, we've had the strongest prices when we get periods of time like this, when exports have been good and increasing, but then we have a real capacity to ratchet our milk production up pretty quickly to meet those increased demand and opportunities for sales. And it just means that we are in this persistent treadmill of having to increase um, our export sales consistently in order to maintain prices. Otherwise, we have the opportunity to just overproduce what the markets need. Um, so exports are, are not a bad thing by any stretch, but recognize, you know, what, what it does imply for us that uh, either we're going to have to enjoy living at uh, an export level uh, with milk prices that are a little lower on average than when milk prices um, are responding to a, a growth category of uh, exports. Thank you. And one last question, kind of going in a different direction, but do you have any comments or do you follow the dairy goat or sheep milk production and whether that production is going up or products? Um, um, could, you, you also could you repeat that last bit? I yeah. didn't quite catch. Sure. Dairy seen. goat or sheep milk production, just any trends in that milk category? No, this is a little bit for me like uh, corn and soybeans, you know. I have to draw some boundaries, so um, I'm thinking about dairy cow milk, uh, not buffalo milk, not uh, not sheep, not goats, or anything else that we could milk. So, mm -hmm. no, nope, that makes sense. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Dr. Stevenson, once again for providing this presentation and then answering this group of questions. We really appreciate your insight and availability for our audience today. And then I would also like to thank all the listeners out there. We really appreciate you making the time to join us for this program at the start of the new year. And um, we hope that you all have a, a, half, a healthy and safe beginning to 2022 and that you will hopefully join us for some future webinars. Again, um, in February on the 14th, we'll be talking about the new NRC and what that means for dairy dairy herds and some of the recommendations that were released late last year. That will be presented by Bill Weiss from The Ohio State University. And then in March, we'll have a veterinarian and a dairy farmer tag teaming to talk about um, high production and how they can achieve high levels of production in their dairy herd. So hopefully we'll see you for one of those webinars. And then once again, thank you for attending today, our monthly Hordes Dairyman webinar to kick off this year. We hope you found this information useful and we look forward to seeing you on another webinar. Until then, goodbye from all of us here at Hordes Dairyman. <laughs>